Hello and welcome for another lecture in your California Geography course. This one in particular is going to deal with the urban patterns, the architecture, and city design of California. So this is going to be a multiple part series just because there's as I started putting this together, I got too excited. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to first introduce some of the models that geographers use to identify and to design landscapes. Uh, and then after that, I want to talk about some of the different styles that appeared in the California landscape. And again, there's so much more that I can talk about. And as I found, it's again like on slide 30 that I just can't talk about everything. But uh, we'll do the best that we can. So let's begin with some of the patterns that are identified. Now, uh, as an urban structure, geographers have identified different models in which have worked quite well in how cityscapes should be designed. So if you think about it, when you've traveled or visited other places, how is the city designed? How is it laid out? Where are the parks? Um, where is the market center? Where is the commerce? Where is transportation? So that being said, you know, these cities and landscapes uh, are designed based on things such as the organization of water, uh, religion, politics, trade, war, technology. Every place kind of adapts some form of these models. So if you recognize the photo I provided, this is a, a, a drawing of the early uh, Alvera Street. And you notice the plaza is the central part of Alvarez Street. Then you've got your markets, you've got uh, your, your fire departments, the commerce, the churches. You have all these different attributes of where things are designed. And it, it doesn't just happen that way. There has to be some, some design and sense uh, put within it. So the models that I'm going to introduce real quick are concentric, uh, sector, multiple nuclei, and then peripheral. Uh, so as you can see uh, from a concentric model, this would, you know, just from what we're seeing from this portion, you can see that concentric meaning like cones, uh, where it's centered from the middle as a plaza and you kind of work your way out into rings, you can kind of see that there's been some design of that scape. So let's go through these one at a time. So this is the concentric zone model. So uh, it's broken up into rings. Uh, so number one, which is the central part, is the central business district. So that's, that's, that's the city, right? So you want to think of a model that looks like this. Let's just use Los Angeles as an example. So you've driven through Los Angeles or near it, and you can see all the, you know, the skyscrapers and the industry. All that stuff is stuck right and smack dab in the center, and things kind of work their way outward. Uh, the next zone, which is this purple zone, is a zone of transition. Uh, the next one is the zone of independent worker homes, uh, which is this lighter orange, this thicker ring here is zone of better residences, and then you have the commuter zone. So think about it. People who live farther away are able to have more space. Their homes are more spread out because they're able to commute back and forth. If you are unable to commute, you move closer towards the center district where all these like apartment complexes and things like that are. So you kind of work your way through the city, through perhaps like the suburbs and then the countryscape or the landscape that way. Um, so this, these models, although they're, I mean, they're not always perfectly designed like this. What's interesting is when you look at these models, think about how transportation has either changed or corrected some of these models, right? Because just to speak honestly about it, you know, maybe, uh, let's use an international student as a, an example, someone who is unable to drive, um, who is unable to work. So they have to, everything has to be by foot or bicycle or maybe a scooter or public transit. They're not going to want to rent homes in areas like this, right? They're going to want to rent homes and within apartment complexes that are much closer. So everything is within walking distance. Now, what if someone is privileged with a vehicle? Well, then that kind of opens up this broader scheme of things. Now you don't have to live somewhere close. You don't, if you want to go to work or go to school or things like that, you're able to live farther away and commute in. So... You know, another example of this commuter zone, Santa Clarita used to be considered a commuter zone because we could commute to Cal State Northridge. You know, that's a commuter school uh, because we're able to get there. So people do live around it in some of the dormitories that do exist, but pretty much everyone travels to it because of transportation. So concentric is designed in a set of rings. Sectors are kind of like pizza. They're slices. So again, you have your central business district in the middle, but now we have things kind of in wedges. So here we have, um, you know, number two is this purple. This is the transportation and industry. So you have, you know, your highways, your roads, you've got your railroads, things like that, people coming in and out. You've got uh, three, which is this orange, which is your low class. Uh, 
housing. So there's more of your apartment complexes and duplexes and things like that. Your middle class is going to be this brownish color, so you can see there's more neighborhoods, more suburbia. And then the high class residential is you know, usually in a, a private sector uh, that has a lot more of a, an, a of robust landscape. So it's essentially the same idea, but they found that in this type of design, things work better in sectors or wedges versus in rings. Another option would be multiple nuclei. This one's a little bit of a hot mess. Uh, this is a community that wasn't designed quite as well as the other ones in the sense that uh, it was a large flat area that people were able to then chunk into little regions. So again, you have your central business district. Uh, you have your wholesale, uh, which is purple, uh, so light manufacturing. So you, you have people that are able to make things. Uh, think about this as an example. You've got your Glendale, Burbank areas, and then around them, you have a lot of manufacturing that's around there, uh, Flower Street and stuff like that. Uh, number three is this peach color. This is your lower class uh, you know, when it comes to economics housing. A little bit more mix here within the uh, medium and then high level. Uh, you also have these other weird things that pop up. These number nines, which are these industrial suburbs. So you're looking at more of those really fancy high rise uh, condominiums and stuff like that. Uh, they also have a number six on here, which is heavy manufacturing. So we find that heavy manufacturing rarely occurs in regions that are close to these more um, high class residential areas are usually closer to your lower class homes and that's because people are able to walk or take public transit to work. So multiple nuclei where you have more of these chunks. The next one I'll talk about is the peripheral zone. So this one's unique because what makes the peripheral is you know that view, your view site of round. Um, in this case you have tr uh, public transportation that wraps the entire community. So that being said, you've got this neat disk of public transit that is very effective. So you have your central city, you have then your suburbia, which is this green area out here. You have you know, a slew of uh, shopping centers, office centers, service centers, maybe an airport complex way out here, a combination of employment and shopping centers. But the big key is that you have essentially this form of public transit that, that really ties the whole thing together. Downtown Los Angeles used to have something that was very similar to this when they had the trolley car system. And that really tied all the communities together because the red trolley system kind of, you know, enveloped the entire community in that sense. But again, this is the peripheral zone. So again, looking at just California landscape, start thinking about places that you visited and which do they fit. Are they more concentric in design? Is it more of a sector? Is it more of a nuclei? Or is it more broader in a peripheral zone? Now, I also want to introduce this one, which is not part of the main four, but this is the Latin America zone model. It's also broken up really much into sectors, if you will, but this is the traditional Latin America um, zone model. So you have your market is actually, the, the marketplace is the central. So kind of going back to this image for a second, this is the marketplace. You know, so um, you think about your... Um, uh, farmers markets and stuff like that. So having that being the central, then obviously your your, com your commercial commerce is important, but to have that central piece, the park that's in the middle, then everything kind of works away from that. So here we have again uh, more of that peripheral design. You have your malls that are all connected within the central portion. So these are designed to be really uh, not necessarily in a bigger landscape, usually a smaller landscape, but to have a little bit of everything into those sectors. But the key is to have the uh, you know, the, the community place in the middle. Uh, we often find in, um, in the Latin America zone that amongst this zone, you'll also find a lot of your uh, churches. So it also goes from, you know, the older community to outward. What's interesting here is that the, this model introduced this word here, gentrification. So this older zone is being gentrified. Perhaps you've heard that phrase before. Uh, gentrification is really... Um, Essentially, it's displacement. So it's really not a great thing because what ends up happening is, um, well, it is, but it isn't, and you'll see why. So what people are able to do is in these older, aged communities, they've most of them usually fall into disrepair, and it usually becomes lower-income housing or lower-income renting and stuff like that because it's usually older and uh, more mature. Well, that being said, um, people who have 
uh, fresh money are able to come in, buy out these older places, increase the rent, and then you know try to restore the design, restore the community, uh, add these fancy coffee shops and stuff like that, um, which then essentially forces the people who live in those communities to then have to move. It displaces them because they can no longer afford the location in which they live. So gentrification does certainly refresh, rejuvenate, redesign, and reimagine locations, but it also displaces the communities that were once there. Um, so it just kind of depends on what side of the debate you're on, because sure, places, you know, if, you buy, if you buy into a, a poor neighborhood, you want the, the housing value to go up. You want things to refresh, but at the same time, these people live there because that's their home, and that's where they're comfortable financially. So uh, gentrification does roll back and forth as being having its positives, but mostly its negatives. Uh, a great example of gentrification, um, looking at places like Highland Park, Eagle Rock, uh, places even going back farther in time, you can even argue what happened in um, where Dodger Stadium is. Uh, Dodger Stadium was actually before that. It was called the Chavez Ravine. Uh, it was a Latin America, Hispanic community that had been there for quite some time. And then the city came in and said, we want to make it better and bigger and pretty much bulldozed everyone out of there uh, to build Dodger Stadium. And so this idea of displacement is not something quite new. So moving into the next piece, this is the kind of part that I was having fun with, is talking about some of the architecture. So California is unique. And when we talk about it being a melting pot, I know I've said it a million times, it truly is. There's a lot of diversity uh, in our architectural design. So I want to spend a couple moments talking about this, and then we'll actually wrap up this PowerPoint. And then the next one that I'll try putting together soon will be actually looking at uh, fast food, because uh, that's definitely a architectural and urban design within our landscape. So uh, as you can, if you probably can imagine, this is a design that was done uh, for the uh, LAX system. That was the first building. We'll talk more about that later. So often geographers consider part of that design part of the Buzz and Woody movement, making reference to Toy Story. So what was interesting is with the help of the Western movies, uh, the Western television shows, things like that, the public and the community yearn to experience, you know, the real West, the cowboy. So we started seeing a lot of these transitions of these barbecue places starting opening up and a lot of these log cabin designs. We also saw some of this architecture in vehicles as well with more of the wood paneling and the wood sides. So with the support of a diverse population and still active ranchers in Northern California, people wanted to experience that barbecue feel. And so really... It was huge. It was a really big deal. And, and this is part of uh, Clearman's. Uh, they still exist. There's a handful of them. Um, this log cabin-esque design was huge. This American West until the advent of the fast food bar, you know, the hamburgers, essentially, because hamburgers are barbecue, right? You barbecue them. Not in all places do it that way. They do it on the skillet. But um, that really killed this franchise because instead of having to go to a restaurant and sit down, they had the, you know, the peanut shells on the floor, that whole experience, now they're able to just drive through and have someone come to the car on a little uh, on their roller skates and serve them and give them their hamburger and their french fries, which was not something they had at places like this, and then you go on your merry way. Uh, not as many of these places exist, but perhaps you can think of some in your landscape uh, and where you live, where you have seen some of this, this older architecture that looks like a log cabin that usually doesn't really match anything else. What I really enjoyed about uh, the Clearman's uh, franchise is that they used to also have, um, like within their shopping center, uh, like the one in San Gabriel, had a village, like a little western village where they had a blacksmith and a leather shop. And you could, so not only was it a restaurant for lunch and dinner, but it was a full on immersive experience. So you can go and buy keychains, you could buy, you know, um, metal work that's been worked by the blacksmith. It's just kind of a fun thing. Part of that kitschy Americana. So I gave you some examples of what this looked like. Uh, so here we have um, the Bear Pit. Perhaps you've been there. The Log Cabin Restaurant. Uh, Knott's Berry Farm. Maybe you've been to Le Chien, uh, The French Cuisine. Uh, William S. Hart Park. Uh, one of my favorite places, Clifton's Cafeteria with this massive redwood that's been made in the middle. And then I have to throw it in here. I know it's not quite Western, but it is quite unique. Uh, this was something that I, get, that I was able to grow up with, which was called Santa's Village, uh, where you could actually go. It was a, an amusement park, uh, but you could visit Santa, the reindeer, Mrs. Claus, and all that stuff all year round. 
and it was again part of that design that architectural design of of that was unique it was very kitschy it was it was cute it was designed to draw in a public so uh, the other one, which this is more of that Woody, well, remember Buzz and Woody were a competition. So they're moving into the Buzz era. We see this vision of tomorrow. Uh, we see because of you know the understanding of the atomic bomb, uh, seeing this more atomic design. Again, we saw it in our landscapes of buildings. The first one really built that we have in our landscape is that unique feature at LAX, but we started seeing it in our neon signs. So we'd call the design, especially here, it's called Googie, um, which is this very unique starburst uh, featurette. Uh, so again, it says, uh, Googie is an architecture type of futurist influenced by car culture, jets, the space age, going back as early as 1949, but some even argue that the Airstream, which was one of those um, camping trailers, it was chrome, really started peaking it and a lot bringing it into our culture uh, and mainstreaming it in the 1960s. So some ideas of that I threw on here. I threw, I had to. Uh, these three over here are all from Disneyland. This is the original Tomorrowland. Uh, here's the house, the Monsanto House of Tomorrow. Here's some car washes, drive-in movie theaters, some fins off of some cars, Norm's drive-through. So we see this very angular and sharp and rounded, but vibrant, brilliant colors. Uh, very Tomorrow and Space Age. Um, you know. It's funny because, you know, thinking about Tomorrowland, especially at Disneyland, is that they continue to, f to fight with what tomorrow should look like. And a lot, of, um, a lot of historians argue that this design is still futuristic. It's still unique in design. Sure, it picked up in the 1950s, but uh, it's definitely something very, very unique. So I thought that was kind of fun. Now let's talk about some of the housing design uh, that's very prominent in the landscape. And then, uh, then from there we'll wrap up. So let's start back here uh, in the 1890s. So this is uh, the, the California Victorian home. So this came actually because of the reign of Queen Victoria in the United Kingdom. Uh, these Victorian design homes began populating in places such as Australia, uh, obviously in the uh, United Kingdom, but they also began seeing being seen in California in the late 1890s. Uh, these homes were the response of the wealth and power brought in from the gold rush. So these were very elegant, large homes, stained glass windows. They were very, very uh, prominent business type homes. So this wasn't someone who, uh, you know, worked anywhere other than owning a business, right? So this is that type of design. So I wrote that you can see here that it was found in Northern California in the Bay Area, also richer neighborhoods of Southern California. So this is an interesting photo. This is obviously a Victorian home in disrepair. This is from the 1960s. So uh, Bunker Hill, so you have the Grand Central Market in downtown. Then you can go up Angel's Flight to Bunker Hill. So Bunker Hill was all of these Victorian homes. So these Victorian homes, that's where the people lived that owned the businesses that were in downtown. So they would take the little train to go up to their homes and stuff like that. Well, after the after people had vehicles and were able to commute and move into suburbia, move out, then a lot of them moved out to the Pasadena area and stuff like that. Um, these homes began falling into disrepair, and then they became actually, the, since it was so close to the city industry, uh, became multiple housings for uh, lower income. And then at that point, the houses just again fell into disrepair. There was a, a couple stories about how. People were selling the homes for a dollar because they needed to demolish them. Uh, are there still some of Victorian's home to be observed? Absolutely. Uh, you have an entire street in L.A. that's got homes still on it. You've also got uh, the the Queen Anne Victorian home um, right there by the in Santa Anita. Uh, so there, and there obviously you have a bunch up in the Bay Area. So they do still exist. There's also a street there off the 110 that has the Heritage Center with all these homes that have been restored. So they do exist, but they're, again, very big. The stained glass, the rounded tops are very, very unique. Something else that came a little bit later was the California Bungalow. So this was part of the arts and crafts movement. What was interesting about the California Bungalow is that these were what we called kit homes. So they cost about $1,000, and you received a majority of the materials by train, and then they would just dump it off, and then you'd build your house. Not all bungalows were kit homes, but a lot of them were. And it was neat. You'd look in your Robux or Sears and Robux catalog and go, oh, I really like that house. And so you could buy other homes that way too. There were some Victorian homes that were sold in that design, but a majority of the ones that I want to talk about here are going to be your California bungalow style. Starting off in the early 1910s as a very simple boxed home, they began morphing. So this is really your traditional 
mail order home. Uh, then they began getting a little more fancy, and then they, you know, this is the California bungalow in Pasadena. And then they began doing this. Uh, this is what we consider part of the Spanish colonial style, which is still considered a bungalow. Again, these bungalows, you're looking at homes that are between five and 700 square foot. They're very, very, very small. But the design began to change. If you notice, this looks very craftsman-esque, uh, and that's because a lot of the later homes pulled from these designs but made the homes bigger. So I thought this was interesting. Um, so the, the Spanish design right here, we'll talk about in a moment, uh, is part of what we call the Spanish colonial style. It came out of San Diego. It was the result of the opening of the Panama Canal in 1915 with the California um, Exposition. So we see that, I'll show you next slide, is this has became very prominent. These Spanish colonial style homes from San Diego, oh, spelling error, shoot, became very popular. Uh, mostly because you can identify them with their terracotta uh, shingles and their stucco designs. Um, often compared to as the early mission style revival, uh, being based off the California mission style. What was unique about these is that uh, a famous guy, Fred Harvey, took this to heart. He really loved this design, and he used it to design his Harvey houses. He partnered with the Actress in Topeka and Santa Fe Railways, and he built hotels that went with the railroad depots. So there's actually one in Union Station. There's still one in Barstow. They were all over the place. They connected the east to the west coast. So all of his designs that he used for his land, for his hotels and his landscape were of this California Spanish style, this bungalow, which was really cool. Uh, it would then later influence the American craftsman style. In the 1950s, we get into the mid-century modern, the MCM design. Um, one of my favorite. I love the mid-century design. So this is part of the American design. Oh, shoot. See, look at that. See, spelling errors. Thanks, guys, for finding that. Uh, the design movement post-World War II, uh, this was really the introduction of the suburbs, or suburbia. Uh, what was interesting is that you used Brazilian and Scandinavian design architects to really create a California design, which is considered this MCM, or mid-century modern. Uh, what they did is they also designed the homes to have these new columns in the middle, so that way you could create these tapered roofs that usually had white rock on top, a quartz of some sort. Uh, to create a more open landscape. But if you notice here, uh, this is a, the blueprint of inside. You've got your car poured on the side, a small little garage. That's it, uh, six foot by six and a half foot. Uh, very large living space and then two bedrooms. And these bedrooms, you know, standard bedrooms are usually 10 foot by 10 foot. So these are actually pretty big. But you'll, that's, I mean, a third of the house is just two bedrooms with, as you can see, only one bathroom. Um, here we have a little kitchen area dining area in the closet. Um, this one here I think is implying that it's a downstairs. You made, some might have had a, 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 a pantry or a, a basement. But very unique. Although observed across the state, you definitely see this if you've been into Palm Springs. Uh, they've been most preserved there. Moving into the Cinderella home, I love these. Uh, so part of the, again, the mid-century modern. But these Cinderella homes are actually really unique to California. They did spread out. Obviously, they, I mean, they have an Albuquerque and stuff like that, but uh, it started in Downey, California in 1954. There's been a lot of discussion because the idea of the Cinderella home was making reference to Cinderella of, from Walt Disney uh, Pictures. But it was the introduction of the gingerbread design. Um, you actually see, you still see a lot of this in Orange County, um, but I see a lot of this design in Big Bear which I thought was very unique. So these very low sling ranch style homes, which means they're one story, but very long, not very narrow, but very long, uh, were sold as a vision of fantasy for the nuclear family, the new family at the dawn of the atomic age. And these were huge. This gingerbread design was, you know, where you have the cutout wood that wraps around it, you know, the shutters with the hearts and designs. A friend of mine who lived in uh, Pacoima, uh, she bought the house in the 61, I think, and she lived there until she passed. But her house was all gingerbread. All, all the trimming was around. The house was done in little, you know, kitschy little designs. The shutters with hearts carved into them. It was very cute. So this is the Cinderella uh, design. Uh, second to last slide, we'll talk about the California ranch style home. I love this. So again, it's a little bit bigger. Uh, the ranch style home is noted for its very long, close to the ground, ground profile, very wide layout verandas and porches, often identified as a rambler house. These homes were emerged between mid-century modern and then again that American West because it was made predominantly from that wood design. 
Popular, very. 1950s, nine out of every ten house that was being built was some form of ranch style home. Um, a great example of where you can see a lot of these is going to be on uh, San Fernando Mission Road down in Northridge. You'll see a lot of these very long, elongated one-story homes with the wood shingles on top. So although some of these homes did appear in the 1920s, they really didn't pick up until the 60s. Because again, of that idea of the, of the broader suburb, when we started building that suburbia, where we had these you know, large, long streets with homes that had alleys and stuff like that. So again, you find these, again, Orange County, and I threw in Northridge because that's a lot closer to where I am, where I remember when I went to CSUN, you would, I, would go, I would take Reseda and you know, jiggle around to get back to the freeway uh, and get to see these beautiful elongated homes with these beautiful porches, the garage in the front, uh, things like that. So these were, all, again, yes, unique to California, absolutely, but were they unique to the world? Well, no, because California, we're trendsetters. So people see what we have, and or we see what other people have, and then we adapt it to our own, and then we branch it out. So again, those are just some different styles of homes that we see in your landscape. Are there others? Yes. But I try to pick just a couple big ones that I thought were kind of cool. So saying cool, I want to look at this. I just love stuff like this. And this is where I'm going to end today. Um, looking at food. This is going to be kind of introduction to California fast food, which will be another presentation I'll be posting uh, with, you know, very soon. But what I have here, these are... Uh, in California, mostly Los Angeles, actually, these are businesses that took to architecture to sell their product. Hoot Hoot Ice Cream for ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. Uh, the Big Donut Drive-In, maybe you've seen Randy's Donuts. Um, here's the Hollywood Flower Pot, uh, Eat at the Hat, uh, the Brown Derby, the Chili Bowl, the Feed Rack, look at these big old ice cream cones. This is I love this one. This And some of these still exist. Uh, this is just being remodeled now. This is a huge tamale in L.A. Uh, and so it was a tamale hamburger stand that had malted milk, had milkshakes. So, you know, this is very unique to our design. Why? Well, because I would actually attribute a lot of it to uh, Route 66. Route 66 really was the first transcontinental highway uh, that connected, you know, Chicago all the way to Santa Monica Pier. And people loved this kitschy type of stuff. They loved visiting it. And I think the big question is, well, why do people visit stuff like this? Because they weren't in a hurry. <laughs> because cars could max out at 45 miles an hour. You could maybe drive for 45 minutes to an hour during the summer. Then you would have to pull over and let your car cool down. Some cars didn't even have air conditioning. So people would actually have to put ice cubes in the back seat so that the kids' feet could sit on the ice cubes to keep the car cool during the summers. So people were, you know, driving here and there was not, I got to get to, you know, uh, Yosemite in one day. No, they took several days. Put it this way, from Santa Clarita to Silmar, that was a day trip. Like, it took you a day just to get from one to the other. And mind you, we didn't have a movie theater back in the 1920s. So if you wanted to go see a movie and you lived at some of these ranches in, in downtown Newhall, you would have to then take a horse or take a car that goes 15 to 20 miles an hour, take you know the uh, the old road, uh, Highway 99, and go into Silmar or San Fernando Valley for the day to go watch a movie. It was a big, big ordeal. So that's why things like this in Orange Julius became very popular as roadside attractions, because it was more kitschy, it was entertaining, but it was because they knew that people had to stop. Do we do that anymore? No, because we're in a hurry. We, you know, we're trying to commute and get there as fast as we can. You know, We don't really get to stop and smell the roses. It's you know, it's it would be almost unheard of if you thought that along the freeway there used to be picnic benches. Can you believe that? There used to be picnic benches along the freeways in, in California because people would literally pull off the freeway and have a lunch and have a picnic and, and rest and then get back in the car and go on their way. So it's a very different uh, culture and climate, if you would. But um, we'll certainly spend some time talking about this. Again, I want to wrap up real quick. We talked about the different models. We talked about the four dominant models in which cities and landscapes are designed. Take those in the back of your mind. Think of places that those look like. We also introduced, I brought in the Buzz and Woody era. Think about that. Think about cars and movies and things that were very popular in the 50s and the 60s. You know, can you think of restaurants that you've been to that, oh yeah, I've been to a restaurant that kind of had that cowboy-esque feeling or that space age uh, googie feel of mid-century modern. We also talked about that, talked about different styles of homes, looking at everything from a bungalow to the ranch style home. And why? Why did we talk about all this? Well, to just explain that we have such a unique urban 
pattern. We are so unique. Can we, we didn't even talk about the light rail system, Larry, which was the original red car. It was yellow. Then they turned into the red car system. Then they got bought out um, you know, by the tire factory and Chevron. And just so many different things to talk about what makes our landscape so unique. There's only so much time. So I hope you enjoy this as much as I did putting it together. And uh, hey, we'll talk soon.